Thank you very much, Klaus. It's uh, wonderful to be back at, uh, at IFPRI. Thank you for organizing the seminar. It's going to take a lot more than an egg, even if it's uh, chocolate covered. It's going to take the egg and the chicken and the cow and just about anything else you can imagine that's related to the food system to solve the, um, the food problems of the world. In other words, we need a multi-sectorial approach to solving the food problems of the world. That's one of the conclusions that Darrell Watson and I came to as we were reviewing the literature and trying to come up with a cohesive um, essay, if you like, on food policy. Uh, the essay is in this book, and we left some brochures outside. What I'm going to do today is talk a little about some of the uh, lessons that we learned from, from doing the book. And we actually did go in and review a tremendous amount of literature, including, of course, uh, a lot from IFPRI. Uh, so I'll, show, I'll talk about some of those messages. Then I want to talk about the food crisis or crises. And then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about what I consider to be the emerging or current challenges in the area of food policy. I'm not going to try to set an agenda for food policy research. That would be um, very unwise of me doing such a thing at IFPRI. But I will talk about food policy challenges uh, as, I, as I see them. So if we need to understand and improve food policy, we need to have policies, policy recommendations. We need to help governments and help decision makers decide what is needed. We have a tremendous amount of literature on what, what policies are needed. We have much less on how. So we tell governments what they should be doing if they want to achieve this particular goal or that. We give them options. Of course, uh, if we doesn't give recommendations, but I can because I'm no longer I'm affiliated with the university, so I'm free to do that. But we uh, are very short on how. So if you talk to a government official, you talk to, an implement, to a decision maker, and you give that decision maker a set of options, if you do this, that will happen, and so on, that policy maker may not know how to bring this about. So we need a lot more work on the how question. Yes, a lot of that is context specific, uh, but that it is a researchable topic that we haven't done nearly enough about. We also need to know who is going to make those decisions. We need a political economy approach to food policy analysis. And by political economy approach, I'm talking about stakeholder analysis. Because it's fine to have the right policy and the government knows how to implement it, but it can't for political reasons. Most of the policies that, are, that end up being implemented are implemented after uh, as a process that consists of stakeholder analysis. So the political economy approach, I believe, is extremely important as we try to understand and improve food policy. I already mentioned that we need a systems approach. We need a comprehensive systems approach um, because we need to understand the feedback loops. The food system is not a linear static system. It is, as I will come to in a minute, a dynamic it's a dynamic system, it's a behavioral system, it can be influenced by the stakeholder groups, by government and others in this business. We need a multi-sectorial and multidisciplinary approach. Uh, no, it's not easy, but it is necessary. And as I mentioned a couple of seconds ago, we need a dynamic behavioral food system. And this is the way I see it in its most simple form. You have a food system which can be influenced by changes in the behavior of the various stakeholder groups. I'm mentioning some of them there, but there can be many others. There are basically three things that government can do to change the food system. Change the incentives, change regulations, or develop and or disseminate knowledge. Those are the only three things that governments can do to change the food system. After the change has happened in the behavior of these various agents, uh, we will have a different food system. That's all I'm going to say about kind of the, the, the overriding lessons that we, that we came, came away with when we wrote the book. So let me talk about five food crises, and then I'm going to come back and spend most of the time on this one. 
And I think that's on the minds of, of most people. The international food price increase and volatility that we've seen during the last uh, five, six years. But there are other crises out there. Starvation in the Horn of Eastern Africa. That is, if anything, much more acute. It's something that has to be dealt with now. I'm not going to talk much about that today uh, because, um, <coughs> because I think we probably need, uh, the world probably needs more, <coughs> knows more or less what needs to be done. It's lack of political will that is not happening, in my opinion. Third, we have a crisis that we become comfortable with, or at least we know it's today and we don't think a lot about it. That relates to the widespread hunger, nutrient deficiencies, and death among millions of children. This is something that has been with us for a very long time. It doesn't seem to change very much. Uh, it is unfortunately something that at least some people, some governments seem to have become sufficiently comfortable with, so they're not doing anything about it. Then we got an emerging, um, an emerging problem. It's actually, it's, it's upon us, overweight, obesity, chronic diseases, and associated, associated death and illness among millions of children and adults. And then, of course, as part of the discussion about the food crises, uh, particularly the international food price increase and volatility, the number one up there, uh, the Earth future productive capacity. Can the Earth, in fact, feed future generations, or are we all headed towards a situation where we'll have mass starvation? Let me now talk about the food crisis number one. And as I see it, there is an unholy trinity, and then there are a couple of jokers. And we need to understand how these stakeholder groups um, operate, what are their goals? What are their relative power? I'm talking about governments, the news media, and speculators. The jokers are the weather and the energy prices. Certainly the weather is difficult to do anything about. We can try to, to, um, account to, to adapt to it, um, but these extreme weather patterns that I'll come back and talk about is, is a very important part of the, uh, of the problem of um, of food, uh, uh, of food uh, price, uh, price for, uh, volatility. So let me now dissect, if you like, the food, uh, the, the time period during which this food crisis uh, have occurred. First, let me start before the food crisis. As you will see that uh, from the middle 1970, 70s, around 74, 75, to the end of that century, there was a dramatic decrease in real food prices and what was, what was the response by the um, unholy um, uh, trinity? Uh, almost nothing. Little policy uh, action. Things were going well. We can ignore agriculture. We can ignore the food system. This is fine. This will continue uh, to improve without our intervention. Very little media attention, except in the middle of the 90s, there was some media attention because there was a, a blip upwards in the food prices. They came back down very quickly. Speculators were not interested. The food, um, the future, futures market in Chicago, for example, worked the way it's supposed to work. Speculators hadn't gone in uh, to that game uh, at, at that point. Now, during the first um, six years of the, of the current century, we see this, this gradual increase. And you would think that those responsible for food policy would see this as a signal to doing something. This is not... This is not a happy, uh, not a happy uh, trend, a happy development, if you have a lot of people who can't afford to buy the food they need. Unfortunately, neither the government nor the media got the message. It took a lot more for them to get the message. Towards the end of that period, some countries began to restrict exports. And some countries uh, also began to reduce the import tariffs. Now, that, that really took effect in the next phase. Then the, the extreme weather events showed up, and of course, the volatility in weather patterns caused volatility in production, uh, which in turn caused, uh, causes, uh, causes volatility in prices. That was nature. And then the speculators and the governments and the energy price helped nature making these fluctuations even worse. When the speculators began to see the prices going up, they, uh, 
figured it was probably a good investment, so they pushed up prices even more. And if we had done some uh, analysis as to what percentage of the price increase uh, was due to speculation, the government policies came in there and did exactly the wrong thing uh, by protecting their, their own people. They put in place um, export restrictions, export stops. Uh, they reduced the import tariffs, the two things I already mentioned. Um, they introduced, they, they basically tried to protect the domestic consumers, <coughs> never mind the producers, because it's the consumers, the urban people that are likely to take to the streets and uh, question the legitimacy of the government. So you saw the, you saw the production volatility resulting in price volatility that was amplified by the action of the unholy trinity. Of course, price volatility has an impact on production volatility. And the question here is, what's the, pri what's the supply response by farmers? What kind of government policy were put in place uh, and the market information that was available? So let me now continue the dissection of the, um, of, the, uh, of the trend. This shows what happened to the, world, uh, to the food price index at the global level, the international food prices, um, during the period January 07 to July 08. So it went up dramatically. What happened? How did the actors, the stakeholder groups behave? Short-term government interventions. As I mentioned earlier, um, these interventions were focused primarily on lower middle-class urban consumers. Why? If most of the poor people are in rural areas, Primarily because every government has as, as its priority number one, legitimacy, maintaining legitimacy. If the urban lower middle class starts giving the government trouble, chances are that they will lose legitimacy. So there was quite a bit of transfer going on, not to the poorest of the poor, but to the uh, poor to middle income urban population. The rural poor were, as usual, basically ignored. <clears throat> they were trying to protect the middle income urban consumers for the reasons I just mentioned. They put in export restrictions, uh, export bans, and they reduced import tariffs. Uh, India pretty much um, closed the export of rice uh, for a period of time, so did Cambodia, so did Vietnam, and a few other countries. And because of that, the prices that contributed to this dramatic increase in price. Countries that were importing, that were importers, reduced the import tariffs uh, in order to uh, avoid, avoid price increases uh, domestically. There was a focus on national supplies and stock buildup. Again, the, the whole point here is that yes, we have a, a, a World Trade Organization. Yes, we talk a lot about globalization and international trade and trade liberalization. But when push comes to shove, each government is looking after its own. Is that a surprise? No, not really. But that's, that does indicate there are some weaknesses in the World Trade Organizations, um, the way things are done uh, with it within the World Trade Organization. There was a focus on national supplies, and again, that can be done by, by uh, through export bans or in some other ways. Huge stock buildup, which pushed up the price even further. According to the estimates I have, India now has 65 million tons of grain in stock. They only need about 20 million to kind of grease the wheels to make sure that the system works. They have just built up tremendous stock. So has China and a few other countries. Irrational expectations made the, in, the speculators or the investors continue to push up the price. And instead of having a market, a futures, a futures for grain, you had a futures for contracts. So because as more speculators came in, pushed up the price, and more speculators were coming in, I talked to a speculator not very long ago, and he said, I kept buying in the futures market as prices were going up because there would surely be one more fool out there who would pay even more. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if that's the best way to characterize what they did, but they certainly pushed up prices, prices dramatically. How do I know this? Well, there are a number of indications. One is that the rice price skyrocketed when, when India put in place an export ban and, and Vietnam and Cambodia and others followed. 
the price kept going up. The Philippines, which is a net importer of rice, became very concerned because in the Philippines, the rice price is an important component to assure um, uh, that, um, that government can stay, can stay in power, that they have legitimacy. When the uh, rice price were up to roughly $1,000 a ton, that was uh, the time when the Philippines bought um, a whole year's supply from Thailand instead of three months' supply, which they would usually do. So they just went all in. They went all out and got for a whole year at an extremely high price. Then there was some uh, rice sitting in Japan that Japan had imported from the United States as part of the WTO agreement, but the Japanese didn't really uh, want this rice. It wasn't the kind of rice that they preferred, so it was sitting in warehouses. There was quite a bit of discussion back and forth as to whether they could release some of that rice, and uh, I believe the U.S. government actually had to agree to that. The U.S. government finally agreed to that, and about five minutes after they agreed, the rice price dropped dramatically. As far as I know, no rice was ever released from those stocks. This was pure speculation. The media, of course, likes sensation, and if you don't have a sensation, they'll make one. Uh, if I haven't offended everybody by now, I'll, I'm, I'm working on it. But it seems to me that there was a tremendous exaggeration by the media, by the media when prices began to go up in the period I just showed you. That, of course, would push prices higher because the decision makers got worried. So they would, they would act uh, in, in as though the prices would, would continue to go up almost forever. So the media, while the media is usually a very important component of uh, democracy and, in fact, of how we do business, in this case, it seems that they didn't, uh, they didn't stick with what they, were, what they should have been doing. This is just an illustration. Uh, I have a whole stack of uh, newspaper articles, front page stuff that says, this is the apocalypse, the food apocalypse, this is the end of the world kind of thing. Uh, this is one of the books that came out, The Coming, the coming Famine, The Global Food Crisis. Uh, and there were, I have a stack of books as well that, that say, you know, the food war and the end of food, etc., etc., etc. Food riots. Many of the food riots were not caused by food prices. They were caused by other things. There were a lot of grievances out there. And the increase in food price was just more, one, more, one more grievance. So we did have food, food riots, which we may or may not have had if the food prices hadn't gone up. But to argue that it was the increase in food price that caused the riots, I think, is, um, is, is, not, is not correct. And I can give you examples of um, other things, other grievances that, um, that contributed. Then we got the moral hazards. Now, if you're in business to do work on the food system and you need to rely on donors to get that work done, it is a gift to you that the food price goes up fast because you can then tell the donors, you better give me more money because see where this is going. <laughs> and I'm not going to accuse any organization of doing that. But I do want to mention that every time the Secretary General or the Director General of FAO uh, gave a speech, there would be 50 million more hungry people because of food price increases. He ended up a little above 1 billion, coming up from about 840 million over a period, a fairly short period of time. Uh, those numbers were not solid. They were not really based on good evidence at the time they were reported. So the last thing I would do would, would be to accuse any organization of using this to raise funds. But one could imagine that if one was in that position, one might want to do that. Then we go to the next phase. You have this steep decline. So what happened to the Trinity? Nothing. Total silence. Part of the media kept arguing that the prices were going up. There was quite a, quite a lag time, particularly the blogs. And we've been, collecting, uh, we've been collecting information on blogs as well as newspapers and, of course, books. Um, I don't have time to show you the results of that, and it's still ongoing anyway. But, but there was quite a bit of writing after the food prices have gone down as much as I just showed you. There was quite a bit of writing about the 
tremendous increase in food prices that was going on. So somebody wasn't really following up. Um, and then we come to the last um, period of time, say the last year. What, what, how do we interpret this? They started, the prices started by going up and then uh, prices didn't quite know what, what they were going to do and now they're coming down. Is that the beginning of a downward trend or is it just a blip uh, towards an upward trend? And what did the um, government news media and speculators do? Um, there was, the, the media came right back and some of them never stopped. They kept preaching apocalypse when the prices were high or low, but they came right back and said, you see, this is the second <coughs> warning you have. Speculators were extremely nervous. People were losing lots of money. There was a lot of confusion among governments. What does this mean? Should we invest in agriculture or is the problem solved? And then, of course, we're all waiting for the next extreme weather event, event which may push the prices up again. That's all I want to say about the, um, the food crisis. Let me now talk about the most important policy challenges as I see them in the context of the crisis as well as the long-term solutions of the food uh, issue or food problem. We all know we need to focus on a small hole. Um, that is a given. If we're going to help, or if the governments are going to help resolve the food security and nutrition problem, governments have to focus on a small hole. Yes, as an intended beneficiary, but not as the actor because the farmer in most cases is in a straitjacket. And you can work with the farmer to increase yields or improve knowledge or other things, but if what uh, is surrounding the farmer is not going to be changed, nothing much is going to happen. And I want to make that case with, with a few more, few more points. But the point I'm making here is that the policy action that we need is outside the farm. The farmer will be responding to that and hopefully benefiting from that. But that's very different from saying all of the policy action now has to be focused on the small farmer and what the small farmer can do differently. No, she can't. She's stuck. Very low total supply elasticity, we know that. That's an old story. Prices change, farmers don't respond very much. If the price change of one commodity, they may shift uh, to some other commodity, but the total response uh, to, price, uh, to price changes is very, is very limited for the reasons I just mentioned. Large yield gaps, an old story. But we don't solve that problem by telling the farmer what to do differently. We change the external environment. We have thousands of successful farm-focused projects that have reduced yield gaps, they have increased incomes of the smallholder farmers, and as soon as those projects end, the farmer drops right back to where he was before unless the surrounding environment has changed. The Sasakawa project is an illustration of that. Very successful as long as the project people assured that the farmer could get access to inputs at a reasonable price and as long as the farmer had a market, they facilitated a market for the farmer. When the projects ended, as I mentioned, these outside, there was no sustainable change in the outside, in the outside environment. The one acre farm, very, very successful in doubling or tripling yields as long as the project took care uh, of the, of the external, uh, external adverse factors. Millennium villages, same thing. Underutilized potential gains from existing technology, I think, is what we're looking at. If these farmers can double or triple their yields, if given access to inputs at reasonable prices, if given access to domestic markets, uh, market information, credit, um, in institutions, if they can do that, wouldn't they do so if we had a sustainable change in this environment within which the farmer is caught? I believe so. But the projects, of course, remove these external factors only temporarily. When the project ends, 
these factors are still there. So the gains are not sustainable. Do we have demand constraints? Is that one reason why farm smallholders are not producing more? Yes, in some cases that is so. When the World Food Program decided or were able to buy food from farmers in developing countries, there was food available. Farmers were able to increase yields, make more food available. Because that was one external constraint that was removed. The World Food Program uh, increased the demand. We have huge post-harvest losses. And that's another reason why we have to focus outside the farm. About 30% of the food that leaves the farm is wasted. Don't hold me to 30, it may be 28 or 32. These numbers are obviously not very exact, but it's a large amount of the food that's being produced that never enters, enters the, uh, never reaches the final consumer. Rapidly increasing demand for post-harvest activities as the urbanization increases, as people are moving from rural to urban areas, we need to pay a lot more attention to the supply chains and the environment within which these supply chains or value chains, if you like, operate. And we are not providing enough research, we're not allocating enough research to the post-harvest portion of the food system. That's all I'm going to say about that argument. I look forward to a good discussion of that side. There was one more, namely the adverse trade politics or policies that both internationally and, and domestically, again, they are outside the farmers. Um, the farmers, um, he can't uh, see his, he can't do much about it. So what are some of the policies I'm recommending? I've given you a list here, but in fact, these recommendations have to be context specific, and they are the what questions, they're not the how questions. I mean, I'm committing the same, the same mistake, if that's what it is, to add to the what questions infrastructure investments, institutional innovation, farmer association, for example, input and output market development, pre and post harvest focused research, because yes, we still need research for to reduce the pre harvest losses, uh, drought tolerance, uh, resistance to insects and pests and so on, biotic and abiotic stresses as, as um, the jargon uh, goes. So we, we, we need that, but we also we need a lot more research outside the farm. And then we need to facilitate small-scale agribusiness. And when I say we, I'm of course talking primarily about governments of developing countries that we can, we from outside can support. Another very important policy cha um, challenge is sustainability in food production. We need sustainable intensification. But you can't have that. I'm so sorry, you can't have that because the environmental Kuznets curve tells me that if you want to increase income, you're going to damage your natural resources. As you climb up that, um, that graph from the left, uh, you increase income and you increase degradation. At some point when you hit the max, the society or the individual is now sufficiently well off to wanting to uh, try to remedy some of the damage done to natural resources. I don't believe that that curve is correct. Uh, I think it was used uh, for air pollution in some big cities, and it may be correct there. I don't know. That's, uh, that's above my pay grade. But to use that for the food system is inappropriate. Because we have multiple winds in the food system. Let me show you what the graph would then look like. I call that stage one. Let's suppose you have a catalyst such as improved or better access to fertilizers, or organic matters, or better production systems. It takes a catalyst to get the smallholder farmer going. That smallholder farmer will apply the plant nutrients, which will increase yields, it will increase income, and it would increase food produced. You've got a triple win right there. But yes, it does take a catalyst to get that going. But the point I'm making here is that a lot of the degradation that takes place a lot of the degradation of natural resources that takes place takes place because low-income people, many of whom are in rural areas, most of whom are in rural areas, are doing damage to natural resources to survive. It's not, it's not good enough to tell them they shouldn't do that. They only do it because they have no other option. 
I also think if we're interested in sustainability, we have to move towards a full costing. And by that I'm talking about estimating the cost of the damage we're doing to natural resources and to the climate, adding that cost to the production cost and have the consumer pay for it. Then your um, pushnet curve is going to look differently. We have the stage one, and I can only point to one side and apologize. So we have stage one, which is where I think you have multiple winds. Then you have the, the current Kushner's curve, which may well be true in some cases, uh, and then you have full casting where you can actually avoid doing degradation as incomes go up. Now, do I have any data to back this up? No, I do not. This is a hypothesis. This is something I think we need to work on a lot more to see if we can't achieve the dual goal of sustainable management of natural resources and the climate on the one hand and increase production of food on the other. That's what I call sustainable intensification. We need international institutional innovation to make that happen. Let me give you just one example. The Danish cows burp a lot. Every time they burp, they release uh, methane gas. When you convert that to CO2 equivalent, uh, they're doing damage to natural resources by contributing, uh, they're doing damage to the climate by contributing to um, global warming. So why don't we put a tax on the cows, a burp tax. And they actually talked about it in the Danish parliament and they came to the conclusion that if they did that, they would run the Danish cattle uh, farmers out of business because the Germans were not going to do that and others were not going to do it. So if we are going to um, try to um, arrive at a full casting or move in that direction, and a burp tax on cows is only, <coughs> is only an example. There are many, many ways we can begin to what economists call endogenize the externalities, natural resource and climate externalities. <coughs> we need international um, agreements to do that. We can have some green taxes as we have in some countries, but if you go very far down that road, you, you, you cannot compete with those who are um, making money by, uh, by doing damage to natural resources. And given that the Kyoto Agreement was never signed by this country, and given there's not much uh, hope that what's going to happen in Durban uh, is going to make much difference, um, I'm quite pessimistic as to whether we'll ever get an international agreement, something like a full casting, whatever, whatever that may be. Another Policy challenge, I think we, we should uh, keep in mind, and this is something IFPRI has done a lot of work on during the last years, so I'm not going to say much about it. Achieving nutrition and health goals through the food system. We need to break down the silos, the silo between agriculture and health, for example. Nutrition tends to not have a natural home, so who knows where it is in, in the system. It's probably in some silo or sub-silo somewhere. We need to break down those silos and work together, as I mentioned at the outset, in a multi-sectorial, multidisciplinary way. We need to identify the pathways from the food system, not just agriculture, also post-harvest activities. Pathways between those things in the food system and human health and nutrition. And there are clearly win-win possibilities where we can achieve the agricultural productivity goal and improve nutrition at the same time. No, it doesn't happen automatically. It does not happen automatically. You can expand production without having any positive effect on nutrition. In fact, it can be negative. And there are trade-offs, absolutely there are trade-offs. And that's why I think we need to see the food system as a means to an end, not an end in itself. And one of the ends should certainly be improved health and nutrition. We need to pursue diversity in production and consumption. That would help greatly reduce reducing uh, micronutrient deficiencies if we can help households have a more diverse diet. And one way that that is happening is when you have a diverse production system. We have results now from several studies that show that farms that have a diverse production system are likely, more likely to have a diverse consumption system and therefore um, fewer, um, uh, fewer family members suffering from micronutrient deficiency. 
We need to strengthen international institutions, and that's another very important policy challenge. The concentration in the agribusiness uh, needs to be managed, needs to be regulated. We have no antitrust legislation at the international level. Can you imagine if we didn't have that in the United States? Yeah, we can imagine that because there are periods when these laws are not uh, enforced, but uh, they are still in the book, in the books. We don't have that internationally. So the concentration is resulting in exploiting other partners in the food system through monopoly or monopsony power. We need government intervention for better competition. And I already mentioned the antitrust laws or rules. We need some kind of guidance on land grabbing. We don't have it right now. There's no international institution with any implementing or enforcement power on land grabbing. We need uh, policies that will enhance price transmission. <coughs> Only about one third of the price change at the global level ever finds its way to the localities in the developing countries. And it's commodity specific and time specific and country specific, but on the average, about one third of the fluctuations we see in the international market will ever reach <coughs> developing countries. And then we need to clarify and enforce the trade rules. The WTO has a rule that says you cannot put a ban on your export unless you are faced with a national emergency. So guess what? When the food prices, when the grain prices began to go up, India was suddenly faced with a national emergency. No, they were not. But nevertheless, they put in an export ban. Did anybody complain? Yeah. Did anybody do anything about it? No. So other countries followed. It, it's fine that the WTO is putting a lot of emphasis on trade distorting agricultural subsidies in the United States, Europe, and Japan. That's very important. They need to be reduced. But shouldn't the WTO also put a lot of emphasis on the other side of this equation so that next time we have a, an extreme weather event that begins to push up prices, the exporting countries can't just put a ban on their export. That, was, that has been extremely uh, disruptive. We need to learn to live with food price volatility. They're not going to go away. Climate change is going to be with us. It's, uh, the global warming is going to be with us. We haven't done a whole lot to, to slow that one down. So the price volatility is going to continue. Let me just show you three pictures. This shows the increase in price volatility <coughs> for corn, which is reflected as a weekly price minus a 12-month moving average. And you can see all the way to the right uh, that you got um, much greater price fluctuations than we had uh, after uh, after 2000, after 1997. That was a little bit, but actually we have to go all the way back to the middle 70s before we see these kinds of price fluctuations. Same for rice, same for wheat. Those fluctuations are not going to go away. We've got to learn to live with uh, food price fluctuations uh, price volatility. Do we also have to learn to live with higher real food prices? Well, let's ask IFPRI. Are they projecting or predicting? I think they're projecting when they say that the corn price is going to double between now and 2050. The rice prices are going to go up by uh, maybe 50 percent. The wheat prices may be a little less. I believe those are projections and we've got baseline optimistic and pessimistic. Um, so, according to IFPRI, um, with the climate change added uh, to the economic growth, uh, we are going to see some rather uh, large price increases over a 40-year period, though. And then you ask Oxfam, and Oxfam says, no, 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 the price increases are going to be much higher than that. By, by 2030, which is uh, 19 years from now, you're going to see corn prices uh, as high as 175% uh, more than they are today. Are these predictions? I'm not sure. Is that really what's going to happen? I don't think so. Here are some of the real reasons 
or some of the reasons why the real food price does not need to change or to increase. Now, fluctuations are going to be with us. I don't know if we can do much about that until we get a hold of climate change, which we may never do. We got the moral hazard again. We need to be very responsible when we report on what's happening in the food system so we don't sensationalize, so we don't dramatize, even if the news media want us to. We should not. We can reduce the yield gaps. The yield gaps we have traditionally looked at, and yield gap, of course, is the difference between what the farmer is producing and what she could produce. And the yield gap has traditionally been, the solution to it has traditionally been, well, let's give, let's give the small farmer better technology or access to credit. Well, my position is that the reason that we have the large yield gaps is found outside of the farm. It's, uh, it's found by lack of infrastructure, lack of institutions, and I mentioned a few other things when I talked about the outside the farm uh, constraint. Risk management, very, very important to manage, to manage the, um, the uh, yields and to reduce the yield, the yield gaps. And remember all these projects, that are, as I mentioned, they were capable of reducing the yield gap, dramatically in some cases, with the existing technology. Now, does this mean we shouldn't do agricultural research anymore? Of course not. But the research we do today is going to have an effect 20 years from now. We are benefiting from the research that was done 20 years ago. So yes, we need to do more agricultural research, but that in itself is not going to solve the problem unless we utilize the results from that research. Property rights are extremely important for reducing the yield gaps. Presumably, the stock buildup is going to end. More than half of the 65 million tons of grain that India has in stock is sitting outside. They don't have the facilities to put a roof over these things. It's rotting. So presumably, that is going to come to an end, which again would slow down any potential price increases. There is a lot of underutilized land that can be brought into production it will have to be done in such a way that it doesn't do damage to natural resources, but there is plenty of land still available. Here is one illustration of the kind of land that could be turned into food production. Uh, this one happens to be vertical, uh, but we could, <laughs> and it is part of an art exhibit, I believe, but I put this in um, because I think urban agriculture is an important component of this. There's a lot of underutilized resources uh, in the urban areas, uh, and of course much more so in the rural areas. We need to reduce the post-harvest losses, and there are many ways of doing that. Transportation facilities, storage facilities, the whole infrastructure question. And this, of course, is where the private sector enters in uh, big time in helping to do this. We need to improve the water use efficiency. The efficiency in water use in agriculture in many places is very low and it can be greatly increased and we have experts in the room that can speak to this. The cost of desalinating seawater has dropped dramatically during the last few years and the question is will it, can we bring that cost down to a level where, uh, where it can be uh, used economically in agriculture. Um, I hope it can, but I don't know. Now, there's, an, there's a question of energy use, and again, we have to look for sustainable sources of energy for the desalination. I would like the US government to end the biofuel mandates, and once they've done that, they should end the subsidies. Subsidies are really not binding right now. Mandates are. I think we should use biomass that's not in competition, biomass from for fuel that's not in competition with food for the resources or for the output. And appropriate policy action, for sure, that's like motherhood. Um, but the point, the point I'm making here is we need governments to take action. It's not enough to write another plan. There are so many plans, there's so much rhetoric out there. The meeting in Italy by G8 uh, support it with others, and I believe most of the G20 people were there as well. The agreement was to allocate 20 billion US dollars, it later became 22 billion US dollars for agricultural development and food security improvement. 
Very little of that money has forthcome. That meeting was held two or three years ago. So we really have a responsibility, whether we are a developing country farmer, private sector, government, or an international development assistance agency, and not to make promises we can't keep. And we're not keeping this promise. And let me end on this one. The conferences we go to usually are missing a translator that will translate rhetoric into action. We need to stop having international conferences or trying to make sure that they result in action. And with that, Klaus, I probably offended everybody, <coughs> let me stop. <laughs>